Excellencies, dear colleagues, good afternoon uh, to who is with us uh, in this room uh, at the meetings of the Conference of the Parties to the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, convening here in Geneva. And good morning, good afternoon or good evening to who is with us uh, online or is now watching the video of the event. We have the pleasure to welcome you for a side event that will focus on children and their exposure to pesticides and other hazardous chemicals. This event is co-organized by the Office of the High Commissioner, Commissioner for Human Rights, together with the United Nations Environment Programme and the Food and Agriculture Organization Secretariats of the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, with the support of the Geneva Environment Network. We have on the panel today here in the room and online leading experts representing different types of stakeholders to discuss the risks, exposure of children to pesticides and approaches to prevent and remedy such risks, including uh, through human rights-based approaches to the environmental sound management and disposal of hazardous chemicals and weights with a particular focus on children's human rights. We are in Geneva, the city known uh, to be the city for human rights, hosting various human rights bodies, including the Human Rights Council, which is currently holding its uh, fifth, uh, fifth session. What a milestone. It is particularly important to remind here that in October uh, last year, the Human Rights Council in its uh, resolution of 4813 adopted a landmark decision and recognized for the first time that having a clean, healthy and sustainable environment is a human right, in particular for those in vulnerable situ situations, such as children, calling on states around the world to work together uh, and with other partners to implement this new, newly recognized right. All environmental negotiations and international environmental meetings I have been uh, attending uh, since then have been highlighting this important uh, milestone. It is also to be noted that in June uh, last year, prior to the Human Rights Council and Mark Resolution, uh, the heads of United Nations entities have affirmed their joint commitment to promoting the rights of children and youth to a healthy environment and their mindful uh, uh, participation in decision making at all levels in relation to this topic. Last week here in Geneva, uh, let me also mention this important uh, milestone, uh, the, seven, the 110th sorry, International Labour Conference concluded adopting a resolution to add a safe and healthy working environment to the existing uh, four fundamental principles and rights at work. And this uh, has uh, already been mentioned in various side events uh, taking place uh, here this week that you might have attended yourself. The topic we are discussing today is followed in depth by the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Toxics, Marcos Orellana, who, cannot, who um, is not with us today and is encouraging events that can raise awareness on this topic. The Special Rapporteur has been denouncing how some wealthy states have deplorably practiced uh, uh, of exploring uh, domestically uh, banned toxic chemicals, including pesticides, to third countries. The Special Rapporteur has also been urging action to address alarming increase of child labor in agricultural sector, where they are exposed to toxic chemicals, including um, highly hazardous uh, pesticides. Proceeding now with the opening remarks and setting the scene uh, of this event, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Christine uh, Fuel, Senior Technical Officer and Coordinator of the Secretariat of the Rotterdam Convention at the Food and Agriculture Organization. The Rotterdam Convention is indeed the body that assists parties to reduce risks from certain hazardous pesticides. Uh, Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and thank you very much to all of those who are in here who are interested in, in listening and learning more about this very important topic. As we already heard, it was the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Hazardous Substances and Waste, Marcos Oriela, Orialana, who was much hoped for to open this important site event but unfortunately he could not be with us today. And so it is my honor to address you, to highlight some important facts and pave the way for the important and interesting speakers we have today and we have the opportunity to listen to today. 12th June was the World Day Against Child Labor this day serves as a catalyst 
to take forward the global movement against that practice. And this site event is aiming at allowing discussions across relevant stakeholders on the unacceptable risk of children as one of the groups in most vulnerable situations due to pesticide exposure and on approaches to prevent and remedy such risks, including through human rights-based approaches to the environmentally sound management and disposal of hazardous chemicals and waste. Globally, agriculture is one of the three most dangerous employment sectors for any age group in terms of work-related illness, accidents, and fatalities. Children below 18 years of age are among those particularly vulnerable to hazardous work. Today, 160 million boys and girls, and that is almost one in 10 of all children worldwide, is engaged in child labor. The agricultural sector, such as crop farming, fisheries and agriculture, aquaculture, livestock and forestry, accounts for more than 70% of all child labor. The agricultural sector with pesticides and agrochemicals poses a serious risk to the health of rural workers and communities and especially to children. Not everybody is equally exposed to hazardous pesticides and chemicals as well as related wastes. Due to biological but also socioeconomic factors, some groups can be more at risk because they find themselves in vulnerable situations such as being deprived of fundamental human rights and forced to choose between their health and their income. In rural areas, farmers are often poorly protect protected under labor law. They often lack access to health, information, training services, and personal protective equipment required to adequately respond to health hazards. Coming back to child labor, child labor is a serious violation of human rights. Yet many vulnerable families worldwide have no choice but to engage their children in work that may be hazardous or prevent them from going to school because they need that income or contribution to survive. Child labor is defined as work that is inappropriate for a child's age because it interferes with ch children's education and is likely to harm their health, safety, and moral. It is worth mentioning that not all work carried out by children is considered as child labor, as long as it is age appropriate, an age appropriate task that is not hazardous and does not interfere with a child's education, as an example. Child labor in rural areas is triggered by a series of factors such as low family incomes, few livelihood alternatives, poor access to education and limited labor law enforcement, weak management of aquatic resources, environmental degradations, and others. Since child labor is predominantly found in the agricultural sector, Addressing children's exposure to pesticides and other hazardous chemicals should be made a top priority. We need to raise awareness among all relevant stakeholders on the risk pesticides are posing, especially to children. This is one of the activities the Rotterdam Convention places particular importance on. Pesticides have to be managed safely and must not be handled by children. 
the effective enjoyment of human rights, in particular children's rights, and their right to health, are connected with the sound management of hazardous substances, including pesticides and wastes. We already heard that in June, the heads of UN entities affirmed their joint commitment to promoting the rights of children and youth to a healthy environment. And in October 2021, the Human Rights Council adopted a landmark decision and recognized for the first time that having a clean, healthy and sustainable environment is a human right, in particular for those in vulnerable situations. So we need to identify potential actions and partnerships that national stakeholders may engage and uh, may engage in to reduce children's exposure to pesticides. We need to identify areas where right-based approaches have major impacts on the implementation of the chemicals and waste conventions, like the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions. And we need to disseminate widely guidance and tools on pesticide management and exposure prevention. It is my great hope that this site event will trigger a decisive step towards concrete action against hazardous child labors. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Christine, for helping us setting the scene uh, for this uh, event. We are now moving with the panel discussion uh, of this event. We have with us online um, a few experts and I will be introducing them as they speak. We'll start with Maria Lee, who is a child laborer in agriculture, specialist at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Maria supports uh, the child labor in agriculture a team at, of uh, FAO in developing guidance materials and policy documents to prevent child labor in agriculture including on the topic of exposure to pesticides and in organizing multi-stakeholders events such as this one to raise awareness and promote collaboration to end child labor in agriculture. Maria is with us from Rome and will be speaking on promoting an integrated approach to address hazardous child labor and reduce pesticides exposure. Maria, you have the floor. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Very well, thank you. Okay, I just need one minute because I have a little issue with my uh, computer. Just one minute, thank you. Sorry about that. So good afternoon to all, and, and I'm really delighted to join you actually from, from France, but uh, with all the support of my colleagues uh, in the FAO headquarters in Rome. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, some examples that I would like to, to share with you of tools and approaches to address hazardous child labor and reduce pesticides exposure, in particularly for children and uh, uh, the importance of having an integrated approach for that matter. So before I get into sharing some tools, I just wanted to go through a few points um, on the next slides. Some of them have been already shared with, um, uh, from, um, by Christine Fuel, but uh, just uh, um, a few points to, to have um, uh, all of us on, on the same page. So as it was mentioned, agricultural work work is one of the most hazardous occupation. Um, we heard that 160 million children are engaged in child labor and almost half of those are involved in hazardous work. And the, in this case today, we're gonna to be focusing on one specific hazardous work, which is uh, exposure to pesticides, but I just want, wanted to, to highlight the fact that obviously hazardous works in agriculture a lot more 
and there are different types that are also linked to the different subsectors of agriculture beyond crop farming, also in fisheries and aquaculture, livestock and, and forestry. But today we're going to be focusing on the exposure to pesticides um, and children may be exposed to pesticides in very different ways uh, on farm and off farm, but also directly and indirectly. And I think one of the issues and challenge that we are faced with is the fact that this hazardous child labor is often invisible. It's happening at the family level um, or in very informal settings. So it's very difficult to capture it sometimes. And we need to, to pay particular attention on that. Um, what I wanted to mention as well is, um, and, and Christine Fuel also reiterated that as really the urgent action that is needed and the collaborative efforts that, that we need to take for progress to be made on that topic. And I just wanted to, to remind ourselves of um, last month, the fifth uh, global conference on the elimination of child labor, which happened in Durban in South Africa and really brought together different stakeholders from all over the world. At the end of the conference, uh, the stakeholders adopted the Durban call to action. And in that call to action on number two was to end child labor in agriculture. So I think there is really a, a momentum for collective actions to be taken on that matter of child labor, child labor in agriculture, and uh, in this case, hazardous work in agriculture. So, so finding alternatives to pesticide as a hazardous work is really crucial and central to address and contribute to ending child labor at large. And, and as we know, also contributing to the Sustainable Development Goal 8.7. So I'm gonna be now going into some examples of tools and, and approaches. And uh, as I was indicating, um, the importance of an integrating approach we need to look at this multifaceted and uh, complex issue of child labor from different lenses and with a combination of interventions. So in this slide, you see just some examples and I will go through some of them today and, and give you some practical tools and approaches that um, we have been applying. Some of them actually in collaboration with the Rotterdam Convention and that have proven really effective in, in raising awareness and then contributing to changes in, in practices and behaviors. So I'm going to go into the, the, the next slide, which is one of the um, topics of this tree. Yeah, so raising awareness at community level. And I think we all agree that this is a critical level to be, um, to be tackled. Um, where the risks are actually happening and where alternatives can be implemented. Obviously, that needs to be in combination with national level and global level interventions. But in this case, what I wanted to um, share with you and what you see in the slides is um, uh, the uh, pesticides visual tools that were developed by the FAO and ILO with the collaboration of the Rotterdam Convention in the last few years. And we can say that this actually has been really a success because it has been taken up by many different countries across the world um, and translated in different language and be found to be a very practical and easy way to start a dialogue with the households, with the farmers, with the parents, with the children and the youth on how to identify risks and how to start a dialogue on potential alternatives. So this is a really interesting tool. And again, it is available and at the end, I will just mention the, the FAO website where you can find a link to those tools, but very practical um, and very successful in the way that it was applied. And just to give you a sense of what it has inside, the content of it, it is uh, with three parts. One, which is around how are children exposed to pesticides? So really understanding the different ways, direct, indirect, off farm, in farm, at play, at the, at the storage, at the store, etc. The second part is around the negative effects of pesticides on health and human development. And why are children at greater risk? And as, as that was mentioned by, by Christine Field, we're not um, facing the same 
level of risk and consequences, whether we're an adult or a child. And I think our colleague from UNICEF will also go a little bit more deeper on that understanding of the different risks. And the third se section is on what we can do to reduce children's exposure to pesticides in our community. So it's really getting on a discussion with practical alternatives and solutions that the community can um, take on. So again, really interesting tool. If anyone is interested, we have then the link at the end of, of this session. And the, what maybe the last point that is also interested is that it, um, it, it is also for different levels of, of, uh, of uh, education and educated people. So it's completely, um, ex I mean, it's completely fine to, to have this discussion and using these tools with people that have more education and with people that are illiterate. Um, just mentioning also that beyond these tools, there are also are the means to raise awareness at the community level. And I just mentioned two, which are the rural radios. Um, with programs that could be facilitated by agricultural stakeholders and uh, what we call the Dimitra clubs, which are listener clubs that bring together different um, members of the communities and it could be adults and youth and children to discuss some issues of, uh, um, of the community that the community is facing. And these have been also a really interesting entry point to start discussion around the hazards um, um, of child labor hazards and hazardous work and to a larger extent um, child labor. Another example that I wanted to share with you on um, a tool to raise awareness uh, and if you could go to the next slide and that one is also very interesting. It's completely different. It comes from Lebanon and a work that has been done um, by FAO with the support of Plan International Lebanon. So it is really targeting uh, young people and uh, children. Uh, it's a mobile app, a free mobile app. And uh, the, the objective was really to, to promote occupational safety and health for rural children and youth in Lebanon. Um, it includes different messages. And, and as you saw, I, I kind of selected the photos of those that are uh, connected to the uh, component on pesticides. But it's really about, again, teaching the youth and the children on what is dangerous, what is hazardous, and some of the prevention uh, measures, and also indirectly to also raise awareness of, of parents. So it's a very interesting tool right now um, has been developed um, in, uh, in Lebanon. And um, and uh, also in consultation with children and youth who were able to provide a feedback, which ended up, you know, having some adaptation in the final two. Another type of intervention is obviously the capacity of agricultural stakeholders. And when, we, when I talk about agricultural stakeholders, it's really a broad range of actors from, from farmers, producer organizations, but it can also include plant protection offices, uh, extension agents, etc. And so FAO developed some capacity development program at a national, sub-regional and regional level. Some activities that have been done also in collaboration with the, the Rotterdam Conventions. And maybe one of the um, examples that I wanted to highlight for you today is the farmer field schools, which are a participatory approach to bring together different farmers and, and really discuss and learn in a practical way um, uh, good uh, agricultural practices and, and how they can also find solutions to, um, to some of the problems they're facing. So it's a very practical and we realize very efficient entry points to raise awareness of farmers on child labor at large and in particular on the uh, risk of exposure to, to pesticides, including for children. And uh, we, we were really happy to see that some of those modules that were created on that matter of child labor were also integrated in some of the curriculum of uh, those um, uh, national programs. Um, yeah, a last point that I also wanted to mention in, in, the, in the, this perspective of collaborating with different stakeholders is the collaboration with the University of Cape Town's um, postgraduate program. Uh, where um, FAO contributed uh, with, um, with a webinar on, on also raising uh, awareness on, on how to, to address um, uh, pesticide uh, um, management and the risk of, of pesticide exposure to children. 
yeah the final uh, and i'm finishing this this presentation with that is uh with this message of we all have a role to play in eliminating hazards related to pesticides and protecting children um, and i think the the collaboration that FU has with the rotterdam convention is a good example of a successful collaboration that allows us to to really uh, connect and disseminate all kind of different materials and guidance to different um, to different partners, public and, and private uh, stakeholders. And I also wanted to mention, you know, the fact that beyond this collaboration, uh, there is also different actors, labor, health, environment, education that need to be included and in part of this uh, this conversation and the interventions that um, that could be um, implemented. Um, Thank you. I think the next slide gives you uh, the, the generic um, address of the uh, web page um, feo.org slash child labor and agriculture, where you find all the materials that I presented today and much more. There are e-learning modules and other guidance materials in different languages that uh, I hope will be very useful to, to the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for the materials presented and insights you have shared with us. You mentioned uh, in your presentation a program you have been supporting in Lebanon. And moving on with the discussion, we will now turn to uh, Rima Shehni, who is uh, with us here in Geneva. Um, Ms. Shehni is the designated national authority for the Rotterdam Convention in Lebanon. She uh, is an, agri an agricultural engineer working in the Ministry of, Ag of Agriculture and concerned with the registration of pesticides in Lebanon. Ms. Shani will provide an overview of the efforts of Lebanon to reduce the exposure of children to hazardous pesticides. Ms. Shani, the floor is yours. For your kind introduction and thank you for all attendees. Our subject is an Overview on the effort of Lebanon to reduce the exposure of children to hazardous pesticides. Agriculture is in the top most hazardous sectors of child labor, especially through exposure to chemical hazard via direct involvement in spraying, working in a recently pesticide treated field, Breathing pesticide from a nearby field, working in a pesticide treated field without appropriate personal protective equipment, and finally eating with hands contaminated with pesticides. In Lebanon, agriculture comprises the largest share of child labor, estimated around 60% of child laborers work, especially in rural areas. Child labor in agriculture in Lebanon has, an of, has often occurred within the context of family farming. But since 2010, the complex Syrian refugee crisis has led to an increase in child labor, especially in its most abusive forms and conditions, notably in Beka Valley and north of Lebanon. Lebanon ratified the worst form of Child Labor Convention in 2003. Later, the government issued Decree 8987 in 2012, which prohibits the employment of children under 18 years of age, where such work could harm their health, safety, or morals, and limit their education. In 2013, a national action plan was developed to eliminate the worst forms of child labor. The Rotterdam Convention effectively contributes also in the protection of children from pesticides. Lebanon ratified the Rotterdam Convention on November 13, 2006. And being a party to Rotterdam Convention contributes to keeping us aware of pesticide risks to human health and the environment. And this through facilitating the exchange of inf information 
about the characteristics of hazardous chemicals and the providing technical assistance for the sound management of pesticides. On 2 and 6 September 2021, a joint activity of Rotterdam Convention and FAO's regional office in the NINA region was organized a mini course in order to raise awareness of the dangers of pesticide to child labor. The mini course entitled Addressing Hazardous Child Labor and Reducing Risks Posed by Hazardous Pesticides. The output and recommendation of the training were addressed at high level on addressing hazardous child labor. Also, great efforts to protect child labor from pesticides have been made in Lebanon. In 2017, a guidebook, Child Labor and Agriculture in Lebanon, was produced, used as a guide for practitioners and edited in English and Arabic, developed by the ILO and FAO support. The main outputs uh, for this uh, guidebook are first, capacity building programs and activities in the agricultural sector in Bekaa and North Lebanon. Second, an assessment of the situation of children working in this sector in Bekaa. In Lebanon, also, we have many agriculture schools in order to prepare practitioners. So, occupational safety and health lessons have been developed and integrated into the official curriculum of agricultural high school as a textbook for students in Arabic. This curriculum was implemented within the framework of FAO project upgrading the technical agriculture education system in Lebanon. It identifies the main challenges and risks related to the use of pesticides in agriculture to be considered as a priority for reducing risk on younger generation. And as the majority of child laborers in agriculture are from refugees, FAO, ILO, UNICEF has published a storybook in Arabic for refugee children living in informal settlements. This storybook was widely disseminated in UNICEF educational centers and the objective is to educate child about risk and negative effects of pesticides and protective measures to be taken. Also, with the full organization with national authorities in Lebanon, FAO developed a video addressing child labor through agricultural education system in Lebanon in 2021, this video presents the visual guide of FAO, ILO, UNICEF on protecting youth from harmful and non-age appropriate agriculture tasks. In 2022, an assessment of child labor in greenhouses in Akkar and Mount Lebanon is conducted by FAO also. It provides valuable data on the incidence and modalities of children's exposure to pesticides in the targeted greenhouses. Because of the largest share of child labor in agriculture in Lebanon, effort must be continuous. And protecting children from pesticides requires coordinated effort by all stakeholders, from the level of policy makers right down to the level of employers and workers. And this by enforcing legislation by implementing national policy on safety and health for children, enforcing the hazardous work list decree 8987 and clarify that the application of pesticides should be clearly prohibited for children. And increasing capacity of labor inspection systems in the rural and agricultural areas. Second is to raise awareness by strengthening the role of agricultural extension officials in order to provide appropriate training on the impact of pesticides on children and intensifying advertising and media campaigns to educate society about the danger of pesticides. I thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shelley. And so we are now moving uh, with the agenda of this event. Um, um, after having heard the experience uh, uh, of Lebanon, our next speaker is, join is joining us virtually. We are delighted to have with us uh, Mikiko Otani, uh, who is an international human rights uh, lawyer based in Tokyo. Um, Ms. Otani is the chair of the United Nations Committee uh, on the Rights of the Child. Ms. Ota Mrs. Otani, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm uh, uh, very pleased uh, to participate in this uh, side event. Um, I'd like to uh, bring up three points. And the first point is about the raising awareness. And uh, my previous speakers have already um, uh, raised the importance of the raising awareness. Uh, and also, the, I think uh, Maria has spoke about the uh, tool uh, to raise awareness uh, for the children. And also, I think Rima uh, spoke about the raising awareness among the agricultural sector and um, policy makers. My uh, focus is um, on the child rights com community side. Like um, the, now uh, you are uh, promoting uh, the issue uh, for uh, the agriculture side and uh, child labor, um, communities, but I think uh, it is also very much necessary uh, for the um, states and uh, policymakers and experts like us and uh, the child rights NGOs are working for and working with the children to understand uh, the negative impact of uh, the hazardous uh, exposure of the children to the pesticides and other hazardous chemicals as the child rights issues. Um, the, not only this issue, but uh, overall uh, environmental related uh, issues are seen and um, taken as some um, issues which we are not uh, naturally familiar with. And, uh, but this is very important issue uh, for the health of the children. And um, so we need uh, to involve uh, more child rights um, uh, people like us, the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And I'm very happy to know that Isabel uh, from Green, I will be also um, one of the panelists uh, today. So that's the first point, and I'd like to say that for that purpose, uh, the awareness is growing about the relationship between the child children's rights and uh, environmental issues, which includes uh, the exposure of the children uh, to pesticides. And I'm happy to share with you that uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, decided uh, last year uh, to draft a new general comment on the children's rights and the environment with a special focus on climate change. The general comment, you may, you may not be familiar with this, uh, but the general comment is the authoritative guidance um, by the committee uh, to the all state parties uh, who, uh, who, who, who ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child which are actually 196 uh, countries. So it has uh, the um, impact on the, we hope that our general comment will have the impact on the uh, policymakers at the national level and also raise awareness about uh, this issue uh, with the clear recommendation what uh, the state parties need to do, need to, do uh, to address uh, the issue of environmental impact uh, and including this uh, issue. And also, this is the opportunity uh, to uh, promote a child rights based approach uh, to um, this issue, the exposure of the children to this right? But I'd like to uh, emphasize, uh, as all the other speakers uh, mentioned, other speakers mentioned is that uh, the protectoral approach, I would say, is a multi-dimensional approach. Um, it, the context of the child rights, uh, this is the issue of the right uh, to the girls, uh, the right to development, and also we can include this issue into the education, as other speakers uh, mentioned, and environmental health, uh, which uh, we are working on. And child labor. And because uh, we all know, all know uh, that child labor is a very important element uh, of this issue. 
but in the community at this moment, very uh, much we focus on the minimum age for the child. Um, but I think uh, in our work, uh, the committee uh, should um, integrate these issues, more focusing on one of the very, very clear issues of the hazardous child labor when we deal with the uh, state parties report. And, um, uh, finally, I'd like to uh, mention that um, the one of the key of the child rights based approach to this issue is child participation. We need to include uh, the children uh, to hear from them, their experiences, their concerns and uh, work with the with the children as partners for these issues. And uh, the committee uh, should be um, utilized more to address these issues because we uh, monitor the implementation of the convention by 196 countries. And our com com convention clearly says that uh, UN agencies uh, can report on the relevant issues and we often receive the report from the UNICEF, but ILO and FAO uh, can bring the um, actual examples and concerns when we uh, review such countries. So that's what we can make a very clear uh, targeted recommendation uh, to the countries, such as I just learned uh, from my previous feedback about the situation in Lebanon, and I learned that uh, the refugee students are exposed uh, at the least about the exposure to the pesticides. So that kind of very uh, concrete uh, information is very necessary to answer the local uh, uh, recommendation to the state party. So I'm happy that uh, you, uh, we can work on multiple sectors and uh, multi uh, sector, multi stakeholders uh, approach and community of right to the child it should be part of this um, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Atani. Our next, next speaker is also joining us uh, virtually. Desiree uh, Narvaez is an environmental uh, health specialist uh, who works at, the, at UNICEF in New York. Um, and she's the technical lead of UNICEF's Healthy Environments for Healthy Children Global Framework. Uh, since the end of uh, 2020, Desiree was uh, previously, previously based here in Geneva and regularly attending uh, these uh, meetings. With that, Desiree, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diana. And I'm so pleased to see uh, colleagues and friends um, joining you at the ACG. Um, so good morning from New York. So, and thanks so much to the organizers for inviting UNICEF. Indeed, UNICEF is the um, UN organization that is mandated by the Committee on the Rights of the Child, Convention on the Rights of the Child. And um, so for the next slide, I will uh, share with you why um, we UNICEF is very much into uh, prevention of pesticide exposure among children. Um, we heard about child labor, the implications on health, the socioeconomic implications. So we've heard um, from colleague from the Committee on the Rights of the Child that children really have the right to a healthy environment in which they live, learn and play. And just to say that UNICEF has very much country presence. We are present in almost 190 countries and territories. And with that, we believe that we can really have a, a wide reach when it comes to prevention. The increasing use and unsound management of pesticides contaminate the environment that can be a source of hazardous exposure among our children. And children, especially those who live in agricultural settings, are particularly vulnerable to pesticides, which can cause lifelong and irreversible negative health effects. Needless to say, urgent action is needed by all stakeholders to reduce environmental contamination to protect children's health. Next slide. UNICEF just launched its publication. It's called Places and Spaces for Children. And it um, investigates uh, the exposure of children uh, to climate change and environmental hazards in uh, OECD and EU countries. 
And the study found that more than one in 20 child lives in an area of high pesticide risk. This is enormous. So we know, of course, that pesticides are intentionally added and um, these are in places where children live, work and play. And in our uh, session today, we are talking about the agricultural setting. And um, but not only in agricultural setting, we know that children can also be exposed to pesticide use and, contam and contamination of food and drinking water. So children in both agricultural and urban settings are exposed, but children in agricultural settings, and I was really, um, you know, uh, I was really impacted by the statement that in fact in agriculture, um, about one in four children are really exposed to um, pesticides, um, especially uh, children who are working in the agricultural uh, setting. So, and children, of course, are um, from of farm workers are also um, vulnerable to take home exposures from parents who are working in farms with pesticide use. 85% of pesticides are used in agricultural setting, yet how come world hunger is still there? And that 22% of our children are still malnourished and they're still stunted. So, and, and we know also that pesticides are also used for cosmetic purposes in homes and gardens with 450 million, at least here in the US, that have been spent on herbicides. So, so this is really um, something for um, our uh, stakeholders to, to think about and to prevent the use of pesticides. Next slide, please. So the exposure um, among children actually occurs at all stages of development. So from pregnancy, um, there is high exposure because of um, the, the uh, pesticides can cross the blood-brain barrier uh, and, and a mother's exposure can in fact um, affect the fetus. When the child is uh, born, uh, so the newborn stage, um, in infancy, through childhood and adolescence. So in all the life uh, stages of the child. So in UNICEF, we say children are those below 19. So that means um, it's a big range of age group. And um, so the next slide will show to us what are the different types of exposure. Um, as for example, in preconception and prenatal, um, this could really have, there has been some evidence that um, exposure to pesticides can cause um, pediatric cancers such as neuroblastoma and also so impaired neurodevelopment and can also cause some um, uh, childhood leukemia. The exposures related to child behavior and development, we know the children have, um, they have hand-to-mouth behavior, they are physically lower to ground and less mobile, um, and, and of course, the take-home exposure from parents, and they depend on adults for protection. So um, there is potential for increased pesticide levels in children because of their physiology, their unique um, metabolism, their uh, behavior. And um, in a review of studies of take-home exposures in an agricultural setting, the greatest frequency of pesticide metabolite was shown to occur in toddlers. So this is from zero to two years old with levels slightly lower in infants and lowest among older children. So toddlers, that means, um, because this is the age group that, that has a specific behavior that is vulnerable to pesticide exposure. And we've heard a lot about child labor and um, UNICEF reports 112 million children in developing and developed countries who work in agriculture with possible exposures to pesticides from direct spraying and drift. It accounts for 70% of child labor. Um, children and adolescents who applied pesticides have been shown to have lower neurobehavioral performance, um, so low IQ and more neurological symptoms. And um, we know that children, especially those in child labor, don't have the proper um, personal protective equipments, PPE. Next slide. So we know also that children are in a developmental stage. So their growing bodies, they require more air, water, and food per kilogram than adults. And with that, they ingest more pesticide 
per body weight than adults. Pesticide contaminated drinking water have been shown to have the highest hazard indices for infants. And a US biomonitoring study found higher urinary pesticide metabolite in children ages 6 to 11 compared to adults 20 to 59. Children are also cognitively immature. That means they rely on adults for protection. They cannot read or fully understand labels. They, not, they don't understand when pesticide containers are improperly reused to store water and food. So because of uh, this um, immature cognition, there is an intentional pesticide poisoning that occurs largely among children. Even the smallest amount of pesticide can be potentially fatal. Children also have developing organ systems and critical windows of vulnerability. And so the non-occupational early life exposure shown to be associated with decreased lung function was measured at age seven. Ongoing pesticide exposures in children shown to be associated with childhood cancers, as mentioned, neuroblastoma and childhood leukemia. And a very interesting study shown that, um, showed that a DDT exposure in adolescent girls in the 1950s actually increases the risk of breast cancer. So that is really something to think about. Next slide. So we've heard about the, the, the actions to be taken. We've heard about um, multi-sectoral interagency collaboration, but we would like to um, recommend um, creating international standards for toxicity testing that uh, will consider the vulnerability of uh, developing fetuses and children to hazardous substances. Um, we are also advocating for developing an official list of highly hazardous pesticides to streamline regulation and make them less accessible, uh, that those that especially uh, have the transboundary movement. And um, we would like to also see uh, design and uh, implementation and enforcement of public health, environmental and labor laws to protect children's right to a healthy environment, as, as I mentioned, uh, mandated by the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Next slide. We would like to see also governments to have a child-centered uh, policies, which we haven't really uh, seen much. And um, the effective cross-sectoral um, education, we've heard about the education examples. Um, and we'd like really to have um, increased knowledge across um, all stakeholders. That means uh, the, the private sector, especially um, industry, um, uh, to, to share uh, information, um, and our healthcare businesses and governments and, and really um, know about the unique vulnerability of children um, to all types of environmental exposure, including pesticides. Um, we've heard about pharma education and pesticide risk, um, the economic feasibility of reduced use and, and use reduction strategies. Of course, um, we are a strong advocate of the integrated pesticide management, so um, as an alternative. Next slide. So how is UNICEF responding? So um, we last year we launched the Healthy Environments for Healthy Children Global Framework. And this really is uh, our vision is to protect children, um, children's health, um, to promote children's rights um, from uh, uh, exposure to environmental hazards and climate change. And, and one of our key environmental hazard is on um, chemical risk to include hazardous pesticides. We are developing a massive um, online course on children's environmental health, an introductory course to increase um, uh, capacities of our health workers to prevent, diagnose, and treat diseases. And um, We'd like to build also our uh, tools for successful advocacy um, and, and we'd really like to uh, promote um, our intersectoral and interagency collaboration. And so, um, and, and I, I also would like to um, agree that definitely um, it's going to be the youth participation, our adolescents uh, with strong advocacy on the prevention of um, environmental exposure to pesticides and that means protecting our children and promoting their rights to a healthy environment. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Desiree, for having shared with us uh, the action need, needed and, and some of the work ongoing at uh, UNICEF. You have mentioned indeed that uh, youth participation is essential, so have other speakers. Um, we have our next speaker is Isabel uh, Kolebinov, Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at the Child Rights uh, International Network, or known also as CRIN, who is here with us uh, in the room and has come with a video message from a youth activist that she will present before we play it. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, let me uh, thank the organizers first for this event. Uh, it's such an important issue and it's not visible enough. There is clear lack of awareness and understanding of the linkages between the exposure to pesticides and how that affects children's rights on a daily basis. So that event is really crucial. Thanks also for making some space for young activists who have the opportunity to contribute these views on this issue. Yusuf, that you are going to hear in a short uh, video message in a minute, is a climate activist from Pakistan, from the province of Balochistan. And he is explaining how the exploitation of natural resources by using toxic chemicals, including pesticides, is contributing to the environmental crisis that you are currently witnessing. The climate crisis, of course, the biodiversity crisis, as well as the consequences of this crisis on food security, water scarcity. He also touches upon migration of people who have to leave their home country because of not being able to grow food themselves in this context. So let's listen to Yusuf. So we do the other way around. I'll uh, introduce first who Queen is and uh, how this issue is a children's rights issue, and then we'll hear about um, his message. So Child Rights International Network is a global research policy and advocacy organization. Our work is grounded is in the UN Convention on, uh, on the Rights of the Child, and our goal is a world where children's rights are recognized, respected, and enforced, and where every child violation has a remedy. Among many other issues, the thematic, one of the thematic areas that we work on is the relationships between the right of children and environmental degradation, including the impact of toxic chemicals uh, on children. So why does this topic matter to children's rights and how those rights are being violated by exposure to pesticides? We already ha had a, um, a clear answer to this question, thanks to Mikiko's intervention, the chair uh, chairperson of the Committee on the Right of the Child, and we'll hear soon about uh, what Yusuf has to uh, sharing his own story. Um, in, in, his, uh, vid in his video, you'll, you'll hear that um, he's making the link between the use of toxic chemicals which contaminate our environment and our, our resources, in this case, water resources, uh, and what Mikiko already said. I want to focus on two or three other points that make the links between children's rights and um, exposure to um, pesticides and other chemicals. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to reiterate what others uh, already said, in particular uh, Mikiko Tani, and stress how crucial it is to make some space and hear from children on all these issues that affect them. Children have a right to, to be heard and to participate in all matters that affect them. That means that every child capable of forming his or her own views has a right to be heard and to influence decision-making processes that may be relevant to his or her life. States should make sure to include children and young people in their decision-making processes when deciding on important topics, such as the regulation of pesticides and other chemicals. This right is closely linked with the question of consent. And I'd like to, to, and, uh, to, to refer to the work that the former Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Children's Rights has done when he referred to children being born pre-polluted. According to the Special Rapporteur in his report on children's rights and toxic substances, states must prevent childhood exposure in recognition of the right of present and future generations to be heard. Pushing this reasoning even further, I'd like to mention the right to bodily integrity. As explained by, by the same special, former special rapporteur, 
Each human being, including children, have a, have a right to autonomy and self-determination over his or her own body. A non-consensual physical or mental intrusion against the body constitutes a human rights violation. Human exposure to toxics constitutes a, such intrusion, whether this is acute poisoning or low-level exposure to toxic substances. Prevention should always be the primary approach. Every state has binding human rights obligations that create a duty to take active measures to prevent the exposure of individuals and communities to toxic substances. This duty to prevent is now further reinforced by the recent resolution uh, recognizing at the international level the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. A previous resolution dedicated to children's rights and the environment and adopted in 2020 urged states to ensure the right of the child to, to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard and physical of, of physical and mental health by identifying and eliminating sources of exposure of children to indoor and outdoor air pollution and substances of high concern. Another highlight I'd like to make is on the right to non-discrimination, also a right uh, that is in the, in the Convention on the Right of the Child. There are widely divergent, divergent standards of production, use and protection from hazardous pesticides in different countries which are creating double standards. While many states have banned or restricted the most toxic of substances, they continue to export the same substances to foreign countries. This constitutes a violation of children's rights to non-discrimination, and the rights perspective approach must be adopted to put an end to this very concerning situation, which was considered by the same former special rapporteur as a form of exploitation. My last point is uh, about access to justice. In cases when they are harmed by toxic chemicals, there are numerous barriers to securing children's rights to access an effective remedy. Among many other barriers, I just wanted to highlight one, which is the burden of proof, which usually lies on the victims Although they are often denied their right to information regarding the risk of exposure to a cocktail of toxic chemicals. Placing the burden of proof on victims of exposure promotes impunity and denies access to justice. States should consider a recalibration of the burden of proof towards those with greater access to information. I'd like to finish my presentation by sharing a thought with you. As it has already been mentioned by previous speakers, we need to all to work together on that. And my thought, and although this event is a great and definitely helps to raise awareness on, about the linkages between the work you all do in these COPs and children's rights, but it's not enough. As stressed um, by Mexico, we all need to, 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 to join hands and work together towards children's rights mainstreaming, including in this fora. So my thought was to envisage some sort of a children's rights action plan, a strategy in the same way as it exists for gender here at the, uh, um, at the COP, uh, at the Secretariat of the BRS conventions. And um, so it, it might be a discussion for later, but I just wanted to share with you my thoughts about that. Thank you very much. And I think now we can hear Yusuf. Thank Indeed, you. Indeed, Isabel, we have now the video message and then we will uh, uh, thank you for your speech. I was six for women because of the drugs and we left our house in the middle of the night. We know how it feels to live at the front line of the climate crisis. Growing up, I often hear the stories of crop failures and how it affects the food systems. Hearing the stories of mass migration of people by not getting enough resources to grow their own fruits and vegetables. Hearing the stories of indigenous communities around the world, how they are being impacted by the climate crisis from droughts to heat waves and floods. A few months ago, 23 people lost their lives 
because of drinking contaminated water which ultimately caused cholera outbreak in a small town in Baluchistan. The water scarcity is caused by the ongoing exploitation of mineral resources which are which are adding toxic materials to our rivers and which resulted in less rains in those areas. Pesticides can contaminate water, soil, turfs and other vegetation. Pesticides can also um, affect the lives of so many other species such as birds, fish and most importantly human health. Some people are more exposed to the impacts of the pesticides such as children and farm workers. Most of the time, especially in global south and indigenous and most vulnerable communities, the farmers don't have that much resources to work on their agriculture sector. I mentioned earlier, so many people, so many communities in Baluchistan, especially indigenous communities in Baluchistan, are being impacted by all those issues from the mass migration of indigenous communities from their villages because of water scarcity, because of droughts and not having the proper food system. So it's very important to provide those people with resources and having alternative of those solutions and providing them with seeds and other alternative to solve these food um, insecurity and, and so many other issues and as well as water scarcity in those regions. And I think it's very important that the global North country especially provide more resources to those people to help them and to mitigate the climate crisis and help them to grow their foods in a more secure way. To pass out from toxic materials, we need to pass out from pesticide to save th all those lives which are being impacted by using improper way of growing farms and vegetables and crops. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Isabel, for having providing, uh, provided us with an overview of children's rights in relation to um, pesticides exposure, another uh, exposure also to other, uh, as other substances, and for having bringing the voice of Yusuf in this, uh, in this room. We are now turning to the last member of this panel, joining the discussion, Kirill Buketov, who is an international policy officer for campaigns against forced labor child labor and discrimination at the International Union of Food and Allied Workers Association, known as IUF. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I, uh, Kirill, I suppose you were last week uh, at the, the International Labor Conference um, and uh, where there was also an important achievement. The, the floor is yours, Kirill. Thank you, Diana. And um, first of all, I feel really privileged to be uh, at this panel. Uh, I represent the International Union of Agricultural Workers. We are the largest global organization of the workers which are employed or self-employed in uh, agriculture around the world. We represent uh, workers from 140 countries. and. Um, as an organization, we exist for more than 120 years. Within the history of IVF, uh, there were different episodes uh, when we were taking uh, different priorities. For the past decades, one of the major priority for us is, uh, is our campaign against child labor, and it is very strongly linked with our priority on demanding safe workplace for the workers. Indeed, the, the International Labour Conference made this decision to uh, recognize the right to safe workplace as a fundamental right of workers. It is now the fifth fundamental right, and it goes together in a package with the right for a working environment which is free of child labor, free of forced labor, free of discrimination, and allows freedom of association. So these five fundamental rights are interlinked. And we know that in any workplace, if we see one of these rights is not recognized and not respected, the others would most likely be uh, non-existent as well. Uh, out of these five rights, 
the right for freedom of association, the right for workers to organize themselves is central because it is enabling workers themselves to clean the workplace from other violations of the rights. And uh, unfortunately, this right, um, when workers are trying to exercise this right, create their own organizations, they're very often faced with uh, negative reaction from the big farmers or employers or the companies which are supplied from these farms. Because they know that workers' organization will mean an increase in, um, in, in the cost of production and they're doing everything possible to stop it. Nevertheless, our movement is growing and uh, at, the, in, at the global conference on child labor in Durban, uh, which brought together more than uh, 2,000 participants, both online and in person, there was a visible group of workers from African countries, agricultural workers, which were bringing on the agenda their demand for the global community to pay special attention to agriculture. And the outcome of this conference, it was a fifth conference in, in a row, and it was the first conference which decided that agriculture requires special attention. And in the global call to action from Durban, there is a special section on agriculture. Out of 49 recommendations for immediate action, eight are made for immediate action in agriculture. And they include recognition of freedom of association. Uh, why it is so important for us in the context of uh, dealing with pesticides and uh, uh, creating safe um, environment in, in agricultural fields? Because it, it is the most effective way to do it. If you go to the rural area and talk to the workers and tell them there is a danger of explosion of, of, to, to one chemical or another, um, the workers will most probably show a very skeptical reaction at first. You need time to convince them. But the best and the most effective way to talk to the workers and spread the message around is when workers are talking to the workers. Because there, there is a lot of trust. People from the same communities, those who, are exper who experienced um, improvement in their, in their work life by organizing in a union can easily explain to others how to do it and um, show the example. I will just um, read you a few lines from the recent report which we received from our African coordinators on their work in, in, in the countries just to illustrate how it works. In Burkina Faso, the IUF Coordination Committee conducted field visit uh, and met with vegetable growers, explaining the agroecology and demonstrated the possibility of growing crops without pesticides. The committee noted a significant increase in the number of vegetable growers investing in organic production. In Senegal, where cases of poisoning among vegetable workers were numerous a few years ago, the IUF Coordination Committee carried out a campaign using safety data sheets to track the use of pesticides and remedial measures needed. The committee observed vegetable growers increased reliance on the labor inspectorate. In Mali, uh, the IUF Coordination Committee organized a training program for 200 vegetable growers on the fight against pesticides, focused first on best practices for pesticide use, including the challenges of wind and heat. A second phase focused on alternatives to pesticides, including compost and natural methods, with all training sessions available on the vegetable growers, uh, was organized via WhatsApp network. There are more cases. I can, I can, go, go, I can go on reading um, a lot of messages like this, which we receive every day. They illustrate that actually every day, and today as well, thousands, hundreds of thousands of union organizers, workers themselves, are trying the, to do their bit to convince others uh, to change uh, the workplace, make it safe. Uh, and making it safe work workplace for the workers means making it the fields safe for the children as well. We all know that the well-being of children, first of all, depends on the well-being of their families and of their parents. When their parents receive decent income, decent wages, 
they don't need to make their children to work. And that is our first priority, the first priority of the IVF as a global union of agricultural workers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kirill, for having brought the perspective of the world of work to this uh, discussion. So our panelists today have shared with us tools and mentioned actions still needed in order to reduce or eliminate children exposure to pesticides and other as other substances. I, we have now time, uh, a little bit of time for discussion before uh, the, the plenary reconvenes. I would like to turn first to the room to see if, so, yeah, I see that various hands. Uh, maybe we start by the sir, please introduce yourself. Yes, you. Not you, the other the person behind you, then you. Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I am Ram Saratrusha from Sefer Nepal NGO, working for the chemical shift. Uh, thank you all the presentation presenter for making this eye-opening kind of presentation. Uh, definitely, Nepal being an agriculture country, a lot of pesticide, even including banned pesticide is still being used and there are huge level of impact, but not much studies has been done. Uh, so I don't have the facts and figure really about the pesticide related exposure among children labors. However, uh, my, I, I, I tried to put a reference where UNICEF and Pure Earth uh, back back in 2020 came with a report on lead exposure and according to this the, the, that report it was reported one in every third children um, worldwide uh, estimating over 8 million children have the elevated level of lead so my question is uh, to the presenter from UNICEF, what has done after publishing that report that saying that one in every third children have elevated level of lead. I'm asking this because I actually notify about this finding to the UNICEF office in Nepal uh, asking to do something to prevent, because that report has also citation about the Nepalese level of uh, blood red level. So my question is, what has been done since then to prevent the BLL, similar to pesticide exposure prevention? Thank you. To la let's just take one, while Desiree prepares herself to reply, let's just take one or two more questions. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, Diana and the uh, panelist. And uh, I am happy to see Miss Desri from New York because he, she worked a lot in uh, Mercury unit. Uh, my question is uh, from Ismaili. Uh, he uh, uh, showed a video uh, of uh, our one province in Balochistan. I am from Pakistan, Dr. Abbas. So Mr. Yusuf has pointed out that uh, about 20 people killed but i am not sure what is the reason about this uh, casualty whether it is due to the impacts of pesticides uh, to intake by children or there is some other issue just i want to clarify this thank you very much thank you and i saw another hand Le the lady there with the crawler sorry i had to Thank you very much. My name is uh, Carmen um, from the Women's Major Group. And uh, yes, one of the things I would like to express is me, my disappointment uh, when uh, Paraquat has not been uh, put at least on the Rotterdam uh, list. Because what we have seen on the field is that the kids are exposed to this kind of herbicides uh, every day. And that they're not necessarily working, although many of them work in the fields and they do apply these pesticides, 
but most of them are exposed in their own house because that's where the, the, most of the pesticides are kept. And the other thing is that all the recipients where the pesticides come, they are reused for pouring water uh, or pouring like any other thing that they are going to consume because they are like big, they are they, they come basically free after they use the product and then they uh, keep on exposing to this kind of uh, chemicals that are persistent and that are bioaccumulative. Maybe they're not COPs precisely, but they're going to have an impact uh, in, in, in the future, probably not in the near present, but they are accumulative. So I think it's important that job that you are doing in raising these issues into account. But yes, we need to take um, more into account what is going on with small producers, small farmers, the, the use, the, 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 how they manage the pesticides and how much the children are being exposed. Because I do think that next generations we're going to see a greater impact on uh, the health of the people that is exposed to this element. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's give the floor first to Desiree, then Isabel, and then uh, Christine, maybe on the last question. Desiree. Uh, thanks, Diana. Hi, Ram. Uh, good to see you. Um, so thank you for your question, Ram. Indeed, um, lead is poisoning one out of three children. That's based on the Toxic Truth Report of UNICEF and Pure Earth. And um, indeed, UNICEF is... Um, really um, exerting a lot of efforts on the ground. Um, and we ha now have very good advocacy materials. So um, I will uh, send you my email so we can uh, send you our um, uh, videos on lead, on prevention. Um, we know uh, the topic today is on pesticides, but some of the pesticides could have lead also. That means um, we have the cocktail mix of, uh, of uh, heavy metals also. Um, in in um, and and in in uh, pesticides, so um, lead is is relevant to this discussion. So aside from advocacy, uh, we are uh, UNICEF is encouraging surveillance, so blood lead level testing. Not to mention that we need to also have the environmental exposure testing, and uh, we are working with the ministries of environment and also. Um, to advocate for legislation and policies such as um, having banning uh, lead in paint and also uh, and hopefully also in pesticides. Um, we are also um, uh, advocating for interagency collaboration. That means the health sector cannot do it alone. And eventually institutionalization of um, children's environmental health in the ministries of health. So um, uh, in short, we uh, for, for Nepal, um, country office, we will uh, reach out to our UNICEF uh, country office so that um, you will be assisted. And, and I know that the NGO CREP is very um, active in, on, on toxic chemicals, um, including heavy metals and um, lead and pesticides. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Desiree, and we can also share those resources on the webpage of the event. Isabel? Yes. Thank you for waiting uh, this question. Um, so it didn't, uh, in his video, Yusuf didn't refer to pesticide as the source of the contamination. And what I uh, get from his message is that he's making the link with, uh, you know, the fact that climate change uh, has an impact on water resources and the scarcity of uh, water uh, bring people to, to, to drink and use water from unsafe sources of water, which, is, which doesn't mean that the, the, the origin of this contamination was um, a pesticide. Indeed, I've read that uh, it was, uh, yeah, I, I can read from, from uh, an article in the, in the media that the lack of rain this year has caused nearby ponds to dry up with their only source of water being a pipeline which had rusted and contaminated the water supply. So it, there is no reference to pesticide. Uh, you're completely right. Thank you very much, Isabel. Christine, on the last question. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Carmen, I couldn't agree more with you. It is, um, let's say, slightly disappointing that the Conference of Parties could not unanimously agree on listing of paraquat dichloride. We are trying since many years and we will continue to do so. And, uh, and meanwhile, we will also continue to, to work on uh, raising the awareness, but also 
providing assistance to find solutions, to find less hazardous alternatives. We have, for example, carried out a workshop with 12 in, in Asia Pacific with 12 uh, small uh, Pacific islands. Um, and that is certainly a setting where agriculture is not of huge dimensions, but it's mainly small scale um, uh, farmers and, um, and have provided a frame where they could exchange their experience, um, uh, provide solutions, but also inviting um, policymakers to make them aware of what is really going on on a farm level and bring them all together to sometimes for the first time talk to each other and have this aha effect and saying, oh, okay, yeah, now maybe we have to do something about that. We had a, a very good workshop in, um, in Jakarta, in, in Indonesia, just um, pre shortly before the pandemic uh, started. And there we invited also neighboring countries that were using in the past uh, paraquat dichloride on a on a large scale. We are talking about uh, palm oil plantations, so that is no longer smallholder farmers. So also that experience we take into account. There was a huge, uh, a very good exchange uh, and, and also representatives from Indonesia where they received an invitation to maybe come to the neighboring country and, and, and really have that experience firsthand. So we will continue doing that. We will continue repeating that listing is not a ban, but we have to ensure to, we are talking about human rights here. We have to ensure that parties have the right to decide for themselves if they want to continue using a substance or not. They have the right to know about all the characteristics. They have the right to decide, yes, we can handle the risks, we want to further use it, or no, we need to find alternatives, we can't manage the risks attached to that. This is all the Convention is about, exchanging information and ensuring that um, parties have the right and are enabled to take informed decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I saw that there were a few other hands. Sadly, we will ask by the Secretariat to end these events on time, so I propose that we continue the discussion bilaterally and that we move now to the closing part uh, of this uh, uh, event. And I will give the floor to each of the speakers 30 seconds for their uh, uh, giveaway messages and be ensured that all the tools that were presented and documents will also be posted uh, on the websites. And I will, uh, Christine will go last, but I will go for the same order we, we started the discussion. I will start my, by Maria from FAO. Your 30 seconds uh, message, takeaway message. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for, for, um, for this, this great event um, and the exchange. So my key messages is, um, and building up also on some of the interventions from the floor, is to make sure that all communities, farmers, households, youth, children, know about the risks um, of being exposed to, to pesticides and the different ways that they can be exposed, and about prevention measures. And, and I think some of the tools that were presented give a, 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 give a flavor of, of what can be used and adapted. The second point that I wanted to make is that this awareness raising need to be combined with practical alternatives. And we talked about integrated pest management, but it could also be about supporting the diversification of crops, income generating activities, social protection, et cetera. So combining awareness raising with practical solutions and practical alternatives, and obviously the collaboration with different stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Sorry. Rima? A child labor in agriculture is a serious uh, issue worldwide, but has gained particular significance in Lebanon over the past decade, owing to the influx of displaced population from neighboring countries especially into rural areas. The protection of child labor from hazardous pesticides needs the coordination efforts of all stakeholders. This includes the policymakers, employers, labor inspectors, 
extension workers, also the families of children who work and the children themselves. And the efforts must continue. Thank you, Ms. Shani. Uh, Ms. Otani? Thank you very much. Uh, my uh, takeaway message is that um, this side event itself shows uh, the value of um, discussing together uh, by various stakeholders. And uh, we should continue this and also expand um, maybe with the uh, women's groups, um, the, uh, if we talk about the uh, human rights treaty bodies, um, the committee should also work together with the CEDO committee and the Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights. And also we should engage with the business sectors. But again, I direct emphasize the we need to work uh, with the children. Children should be the one of the key partners. And so that's the, my message. Thank you. Thank you. Desiree? Children have the right to a healthy environment in which they live, learn, and play. Children also, um, because of their unique vulnerability to pesticides, their behavior and physiology should not be exposed to highly hazardous pesticides. And um, because of this, the, the, the uh, uh, toxic pesticides actually have um, lifelong um, health effects on children, not to mention child labor and the socioeconomic effects. We are advocating for um, the banning of highly hazardous pesticides. We are advocating for youth participation in the advocacy and that um, for parties of the Rotterdam Convention to comply with the provisions of the convention. Thank you. Desiree, Isabel. Thank you. So as a takeaway message, uh, mine would be about child children being included in decision-making as well, as Mikiko and Desiree just uh, mentioned. Uh, they, they, they should be included in decision-making processes. The second is about prevention. Prevention should always be the primary approach. States have a legally binding uh, human rights obligation to, create, uh, to, to take active measures to prevent the exposure. And the last one, uh, when violation occurs, uh, access to justice is critical and states must provide the means of getting redress to children. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Kirill? Um, human rights and workers' rights should be placed in the, in the center of this discussion. Uh, a safe workplace, um, a farm which is not using pesticides but is using forced labor is not a safe workplace and um, workers right to organize should be uh, recognized as uh, central and yes workers of the world demand ban on paraquat thank you very much and the final word is for christine fuel from the secretariat of the convention thank you very much i will be very brief we are very privileged here we have the privilege of knowledge. All who sit here inside have heard from many experts and colleagues and have also information due to information exchange of the convention about hazardous pesticides, about child labor, about the need to end these hazardous practices. And this privilege of knowledge comes with a duty a duty to spread the word, the word. We have the duty to make this knowledge, to, to raise awareness on that knowledge and, and start creating action. So this is what we need to take out from here. We need to leave this site event, not just as another site event. We need to leave it as ambassadors of ending child labor. Thank you very much. Thank you to all for your attention, who was online with us, who is with us in the room, to our panelists, both here in the room and online. The aim of this event, one of the aims was to share experiences and creating synergies. So let's continue creating those synergies by uh, engaging in our in bilateral discussions. Thank you all.